Yeah, hello everyone. Um, first of all, very bad news for all of you. So, I won the prize on Twitter. <laughs> a wonderful Amazon Echo Dot. So, uh, yeah, maybe next time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm Kobinian. Um, I'm currently affiliated with Dahlia Research, um, and today I want to talk about using Bayesian methods to build a data science product. So um, what's the reason why I'm giving this talk? Um, so many of you may agree with me that Bayesian methods have theoretical advantages, which mostly come from that you always work on the full distribution and don't really bother with uh, point estimates. But um, what I think is advantage is always relative. Now it depends on what you want to do in the end, what kind of product you want to build. And so I think the best model is always the model that fits the domain. So what I want to show you is that we as a startup leverage those advantages um, um, of Bayesian methods and build a data science product that actually fitted our domain. Um, and what you should get out of the talk is that um, next time you as a data scientist want to build a product, um, you should actually think about um, using Bayesian methods and check if it may add an additional la layer, to your, uh, layer of value to your product. So first a bit about um, Dahlia. So Dahlia is a market research company founded in 2013 um, and we run a platform that distributes microservice across the globe into thousands of apps and websites. And currently we have reach in 100 countries and we do around 500 million interviews a month. Um, so what is our product? So we have many products and one of our most successful products, um, which I was part of the team building it, um, is a brand tracking solution for small and medium sized companies. And that's what I actually want to talk about today. So a bit of an outline of my talk. So first I will talk about brand tracking as a data science product. So brand tracking, I don't know, probably um, very few people in the room have heard about it. Um, and what are actually the challenges when you like, build, build it or treat it as a data science product. The second thing is why we actually bothered with Bayesian methods. I mean, it's kind of a, a complex um, um, theoretical framework and why we decided to um, kind of use it for our product. And the second, uh, third part will be um, about just some words uh, from me on uh, PyMC3. So that's the open source um, uh, package we used to, to put it to production and what kind of um, yeah, experiences we had with that. So brand tracking, what is brand tracking? Uh, imagine you're a marketing manager and you're running a marketing campaign and then you, if you're interested if this campaign had a positive effect on your brand. So um, identifying if you had an effect is quite easy in the long run because you just look at your sales and if your sales go up, you know that there was some kind of positive effect um, at some point. But what is actually like a real challenge is to tie those um, immediate effects of every single marketing campaign to your um, brand. So um, in the end, it's very much, um, often, often very much about um, finding out um, which campaigns worked and which didn't. So as a brand manager, you will always want to pour money into those campaigns that actually had an effect and you don't want to stop the campaigns um, that didn't have an effect. Um, this is actually where the market research industry comes in. So they provide tools that are based on uh, surveys. So you just ask people, do you know the brand? Do you consider buying that brand? And then you track that kind of opinion um, over time. So we as a young um, startup, um, we entered that market in 2017 and we launched a, a product called Brand Tracker. Um, so what was Brand Tracker? Brand Tracker was based on around 1,000 samples each month. And um, the final product looked like that. It was a dashboard where clients could kind of uh, sign in and then look at some kind of metrics, brand consideration, um, brand awareness, um, all those kind of things. And what was the main value proposition of that? Well, what made it different from other market research products is it looked fancy and it was a lot cheaper and we were a lot faster because we have this um, very powerful engine. So when other market research companies take like one or two months to do like this surveys, um, we can do it like in a day or two days. But if you really look at the dashboard, you see this thing at the side like a shift or like kind of a filter for demographic groups. And so basically the only thing you can do is kind of like compare females versus males, young versus old people, young versus old people, female and males. So if you're a brand manager and you log into your dashboard and you get it, let's say each quarter, you log in, then you shift those filters for two minutes and it's like, mm, okay, interesting. 
and then you log out and you come back three months later paying another 10K for the dashboard, you log in again, look at it two minutes, and then, yeah, it's basically the same, no? So why is, why is that happening? Because those groups are actually pretty big groups in the population, so you need to have a real, real, really big impact of your campaign to kind of move the needle in those big, um, big groups. So, yeah, so our clients, so what was the kind of feedback we got from our clients? The client said like, yeah, hmm, looks good, um, it's nice, it's cheap, but mostly we use it because it's cheap, um, but we don't really get much out of it. So what we figured out um, is that brand managers actually always focus on niche audiences. So when they run campaigns, they don't run campaigns for all the population, but they focus on very small groups in the population. So for example, if you're a um, company that develops a, a parking app, you're obviously interested in people who use apps who are mostly young people um, and people who have a car. And all the other ones you don't really care about because they anyways wouldn't use your product. Or if you run campaigns on social media, let's say you run a campaign on Twitter, you're interested in what was the effect on people who use Twitter and the other ones couldn't actually see your campaign because they're not using this kind of uh, uh, platform. So what is the challenge of that? So you could just say, yeah, then just track those small groups and um, you should be fine, no? So imagine you have, um, let's say you run like one wave of surveys, you sample 3,000 people or you ask 3,000 people, and then you decompose. So you have a company who's specifically interested, let's say, in young um, females who use Twitter. And let's say that's the composition of your sample. So you have 1,500 people who are females, well, 1,000 Twitter users, and 600 people who are young. And then if you take the combination of all those characteristics, um, you get very sparse. No? So you may end up with only 20 people who share all those characteristics. And if you then get an estimate from that 20 people, let's say um, seven out of those 20 people say, yes, I know your brand, then your estimate is 35%, and that's how your confidence points look like. So it's not really usable, because the more, the more demographics you basically combine, or the more niche you go into those audiences, the more sparse you get, and the longer your field work gets, and the more complicated it actually, um, or costly it gets um, to do those projects. So we had this forth and back with the clients, and they said like, yeah, but that's actually what, one, what we wanna do, so um, if you can't provide that tracking, it's not really likely that we will use your product. So we said, okay, then we need to rethink what we are doing here. And uh, whenever people uh, ask for, hey, can you rethink how we do that? They usually ask like some kind of part of the data science team, hey, can you please think about it? We're having the problem there. And that's how it landed on our table. Um, so what we did, we experimented with a method called MRP, uh, multi-level regression and post stratification. And that's um, a solution that has already been very successfully used in um, the area of quantitative political science um, for election forecasting, mostly in the US. Um, and we try to apply it to brand tracking, so why not? So what's the idea of MRP? MRP basically takes the same, um, so you have the same sample um, of, yeah, 3,000 people. And what you do, you don't, so your estimate in the small group of people you want to um, find, um, you, you want to estimate, isn't just like the average out of the people in your sample, but you explicitly model that you hold all those characteristics independent. So it's kind of like a classical classification problem. Um, yeah, so um, we did that. So um, MRP was already, so the kind of concept was already used in, in 1997 by Gelman and Little. And um, many of you probably know uh, Andrew Gelman, who kind of wrote every second book about hierarchical Bayesian models. Um, and of course, for MRP, he also used hierarchical Bayesian models. Um, but really, it's just kind of, um, it has, so MRP is like, the first part is like a modeling component where you can basically use whatever classifier you want. And then the second part is kind of um, a post-stratification step where you reweight your estimates so that you match the kind of overall population or you get representative of the overall population. So why should we go fall in if we just want to build an MVP and do like the whole hierarchical Bayesian thing? So what we just did, we used like our favorite uh, 
open source tool scikit and then just use some form of uh, logistic regression to do this classification problem and then we were basically good to go so what we still need to do is of course uh, rebranding so brand tracker was dead now it's called latana it's yellow and even more fancy um, so what's the main uh, value of latana or what was it, what it was at that point is that you, now you can really like kind of look at those niche audiences. You have this audience creator. You can look at, I don't even so what. So it's uh, young people, females, high income, high education, living in top three cities and uses music streaming services. And then suck, you can create your audience and can track this kind of group in the population and see what they think about your brand. So this is how um, the dashboard looked like. So you see that there's like a lot more things to click. No? So if the client logs in, they have like click, click, click. They can create their audiences. So in the end, I think they, they kind of get a lot more out of like just this like four filters on the side. So why should we bother with a new model? So we had a working product. Um, it was selling and it was working. So why should we go more complex and think about like, for example, like applying like Bayesian methods um, so the reason is pretty simple. Um, so on the one hand, you, in reality, you may end up even with like the marginal groups, or even if you just have a characteristic that is not composed of many characteristics, you may have very little data. So for example, if you only have like uh, 200 people who are young, I mean, in statistical textbooks, it sounds a lot like 200 people, but in survey research, it's not because survey research as uh, so survey data is like generally very very noisy data so you need a bit like more sample there um, so what do you do if you have like very like little data to kind of inform your estimate of or like your parameter of being young um, the second thing is that you don't have a measure of uncertainty so if you have whatever you run a campaign and you have a jump between the, from like I don't know you run a campaign in uh, October and then you have like a wave in August and then you have one in December and you have an uplift of from five to eight percent So how do you know that this is actually or like what kind of uncertainty does come with that jump? So if you look at Bayesian methods um, This are immediately solved no? because if you have very little data you can just use prior information. I mean you do this um, sampling like kind of in a sequence, so you sample in August, you sample in September, you sample in October, and each time you kind of build the same model again, so you can just use, as prior information, you can just use the estimates from the past wave and kind of incorporate it and just update it with fresh data. So that's the one thing where the Bayesian methods are really um, handy. The second thing is that you always work on the full distribution, so you don't need to like deal with point estimates, but you kind of have the full information, um, and then you get your uncertainty quantification basically for free. So this is a, um, so who of you knows uh, Blinkist? Yeah, it's quite many. They were successful with their marketing campaigns. So um, yeah, Blinkist is a uh, app that gives you the key ideas from best-selling and non-fiction books in 15 minutes text and audio. So it's basically a reading app. And I want to use it as um, uh, a case study to kind of show you how this working, uh, like um, learning from prior information looks like. So 7.5% of the people in Germany know Blinkist, so that's kind of the population um, estimate. And I want to illustrate now, um, so what we did with Blinkist, we run multiple waves, um, each time asking 1,500 people. And so this graph is a bit like uh, weird, but I will explain it. So on the y-axis you have, um, so that's the population estimate of 7.5%, that's the dotted line, and then here you have, you only look at low educated people in Germany, and that's the estimate of your brand awareness. So, if, for example, 7.5 here means 7.5% of people low educated um, know that brand. And on the x-axis here, you have the sample sizes. So we had a sample of 1,500 people, and we just bootstrapped smaller sample sizes from there. And then each time we fitted a model, and we did this in two cases, so one with prior information from the past waves, and one with no prior information from the past waves. So what you see here is that if you don't have prior information in the past, from the past, um, and you have very little data, um, 
the model will not make a difference between low educated people and your overall population because why should it make a difference if there's very little information to back that up? So once you get like more data, you kind of find this effect of low educated people and you kind of converge through the true estimate. So if you have prior information, you, what the model basically does is kind of offsetting the estimate from the past wave and then kind of exploring around, so the estimate of the past wave was probably around like 4%, and it's just exploring around, more around this 4%, and then converges to the 5% like a lot faster. So even if you would only have like a sample of like 500 people here, um, yeah, you would already have basically the, the true estimate. Same story for if you look at people who say they don't want to be productive in their free time, less, <laughs> less likelihood of using a reading app then, um, so same story, so if you, you kind of offset it here like at a lower level and then just at some point they just kind of converge. So what you could say now is like, yeah, I mean, if both of the models converge to the same thing, so there's basically no benefit of using prior information. So I want to show you this one. Um, it's age, so it's elderly people age 56 to 65. And traditionally, if you do online surveys, elderly people are less likely to fill out your survey, so we have very few of them in your sample. So I checked it again, and in this sample of 1,500 people, around 10% were like between 56 and 65%, uh, 56 and 65 years old. So even if you have a sample of 1,500 people, without prior information, there's no chance that you're getting close to this like real estimate, which is a lot lower than like the overall population estimates because elderly people are less likely to use apps and yeah. So I hope that kind of illustrated like how we, how we kind of used that, um, that uh, feature of Bayesian methods to solve the problem. And the second thing I want to talk about is this uncertainty quantification. Um, so imagine you're running um, two waves and you're having a campaign. So your client has a campaign in November. Then you run a campaign pre uh, you run a um, project pre-campaign and post-campaign with 2,000 people each time. And then your estimate jumps from 5 to 8%. So if you use like classical frequentist models, you don't have any idea like how to quantify the jump. And um, if you have used like Bayesian methods, you have the full distribution you can basically reason on. Um, so how does this look like in a product? So what we did, um, because brand managers, they just always want to, they don't want to like bother with like a lot of statistics. They just want to look at like, like colors, like a traffic light or something that's um, yeah, easy, to, easy to show. So what we did, so you can, so imagine that's like wave one and this is wave two. So what you do, you just kind of overlap those distributions and then and look at the probability mass. And then your probability that there was a jump is basically everything that is not like um, shared by those two distributions. And then you can make that scale and say like, ah, oh, you had like a really good marketing campaign, very likely that you had a jump. So how did this look like in the product? Um, so again, you have like a brand metric like aided awareness um, of 25 to 49 year urban people. So that's the whole composition of this niche audience group and it's the client air help. 17% um, um, brand awareness. And then from March to June, they had a jump of 2%, but it's actually not really likely. So it's, a, it's kind of like a lot of uncertainty in those um, two distributions. So they're quite um, overlapping. Um, um, whereas if you look at, for example, at brand consideration, it jumped at like 3%, and it's, so those estimates are like, have like, uh, the, the distributions have like much smaller tails in a way, um, and so it's really likely that that is actually like a, to, due to a true effect. So, um, yeah, so we had a lot of talks about like using Bayesian methods, and I think um, the talk I just um, watched was about using Bayesian methods in production, so they used STAN, we used PyMC, um, I think both are fine, both exper uh, experiment with both um, if, you, if you get to it. Um, we chose um, PyMC in production um, just out of the reason because for me it felt a bit more like Pythonic in a way, so I wasn't really feeling good about like writing everything down in a string and then just sending it to a compiler and then getting something back. Um, there's a new version coming out of PyMC very soon, um, PyMC 4, um, that will use, so yesterday there was a talk about TensorFlow probability, um, the TensorFlow probability layer, and PyMC 4 will use TensorFlow in the back end. 
um, which is, I think, a very, very good um, choice. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, so yeah, so in the end, it's basically, um, I mean, many of you probably already deployed like um, classical machine learning models in scikit-learn or TensorFlow. Um, so you have a data source. Um, for us, it's just kind of this survey engine that generates this um, responses to the surveys. And then we wrap this PyMC in like a Django web service and deploy it on AWS. And then in the end, you have some front end, some uh, endpoint. Um, so the dashboard kind of fetches um, stuff from an endpoint and then just shows it to, to the client. So in the end, it's really not much different than any other like data science um, product or like kind of client facing data science product people build. Um, yeah, so next time, if you want to build something, um, yeah explore a bit um, with those kind of tools. So the summary is um, not only that Bayesian methods have theoretical advantages, but they have like given us like whole new layer kind of, of value to our product. The first thing is that we kind of um, solved this probably, uh, problem of uh, quantifying the probability of change in our brand KPIs. Um, the second thing was that we used kind of prior information from past waves to update the current waves. Um, which is a complete um, game changer in a way um, because that also means that the longer you track, the more like certain your estimates basically get. And that also means that you can track audiences that were not really um, discovered before. So you can go really, really, really niche and just kind of track for 12 months. And then at some point you can kind of uncover those, those audiences. Um, and the last thing is that PyMC in production is not like magic, so it kind of behaves like any other um, machine learning tool. So feel free to um, use it. Okay, that's it.